and beyond. Welcome to the final webinar of our Learning Network and Knowledge Hub's current series, The Misuse of Alienation in Domestic Violence Cases in Family Court, helping court-related professionals to sort through conflicting allegations. We have an amazing group of presenters who will be introduced before they present. At this time, I'd like to introduce the moderator for today's webinar. Peter Jaffe is a professor in the Faculty of Education at Western University and the academic director at the Center for Research and Education on Violence Against Women and Children in London, Ontario. He is also the Director Emeritus of the London Family Court Clinic, which is a children's center specializing in issues which bring children and families into the justice system. Peter? Linda, thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, to set the stage for our webinar today, our focus is going to be on the misuse of alienation in domestic violence cases. Just to make sure there's some common understanding, I think everyone agrees that after separation, healthy, loving parents should try to work together as co-parents. We recognize that children are exposed uh, to parental conflict and they may be harmed by parental conflict. We recognize that children benefit from a relationship with both parents and extended family members for a health and safe, for a healthy, healthy and safe relationship. We also recognize that denigrating another parent is a bad idea. And in fact, with the research suggests from Bob Emery and others that turning children against the other parent uh, may be harmful in their development and in fact may backfire against that parent. There's actually a boomerang effect that suggests that when you're bad mouthing the other parent, it's going to hurt the parent who's doing the bad mouthing. And we recognize that a willful campaign to undermine the other parent is not in the children's best interests. But when we talk about alienation, a couple of things I think are an important foundational pieces. Alienation should not have a capital A. Uh, parental alienation should not have a capital P and a capital A. And there's no such thing as parental alienation syndrome. As of March 2021, I'm still reading reports across the US and Canada that refers to parental alienation syndrome as some sort of medical or psychiatric disorder. Uh, last night, I read reports uh, from individuals, a psychiatrist and a psychologist who are still referring to this as a syndrome. Uh, there's no um, consensus on the proper definition of how to identify or reliably assess uh, parental alienation. And uh, there's no agreement about valid intervention, even though I continue to read reports about uh, changing court-ordered uh, custody or sending children to residential treatment programs that say they're going to treat uh, so-called alienation. Uh, alienation uh, and uh, children resisting contact is not a simple problem. It usually masks multiple factors and there's often the impacts of the system and litigation that need to be fully understood. There's also an important but, and that's the reason for today's webinar, when there is abuse or credible allegations of domestic violence or child abuse, a parent has a reasonable basis in fact to be protective and concerned about the children's contact uh, with the other parent. There may be uh, multiple sources of harm to children. There may be ongoing conflict. There may be uh, prolonged litigation. There may be child abuse and domestic violence uh, and coercive control. There may be ongoing impacts of trauma. There may be ongoing trauma symptoms for children and parents affected by abuse. There may be in 
cases uh, that all of us are familiar with, the misuse of the term alienation to undermine the protective parent and provide disinformation to the court, which may further confuse professionals involved in the case, including judges. In Canada, and I recognize that our audience today is uh, are coast to coast across Canada, the US, and uh, many other countries across the globe. In Canada, we recently amended our Divorce Act to include uh, family violence as a factor that judges consider when determining the best interests of children. And the definition for family and violence uh, includes behavior that may constitute a pattern of coercive and controlling behavior that may cause other family members to fear for their own safety uh, and that uh, or that of another person. Uh, the legislation includes uh, recognizing the harm of indirect exposure to such conduct uh, and it in includes uh, multiple forms of abuse, as you can see from this slide, including physical abuse, sexual abuse, threats, stalking, uh, financial abuse, uh, threats to kill or harm animals, uh, damaging property. Uh, so these are important factors now in Canadian law, and I know these are becoming discussed in many other jurisdictions as part of either family law or in some cases, uh, criminal legislation. We realize that in today's discussion, uh, we're not oversimplifying a complex problem. Uh, judges and lawyers and mental health professionals and social service professionals involved in the court system uh, deal with very complex cases. Um, there's issues around who to believe when there's conflicting allegations. We now know that 60% of litigants in the family court are representing themselves and judges all uh, increasingly finding themselves having to identify uh, conflicting allegations uh, often without the uh, representation of the parties. We know that there are crowded court dockets, especially crowded now because of the buildup from COVID-19. We know across the globe, COVID-19 has led to an increase in family violence cases and has created increased barriers uh, to access the courts on a timely basis. We also know there's a shortage of legal, uh, social service and mental health uh, professionals and access to justice is becoming uh, uh, increasing difficulty for uh, many litigants. So obviously we know that in this presentation and many other presentations, we face a challenge to do a better job to educate the general public and to educate professionals. We know there has to be proper uh, fact finding and screening in dealing with these cases. We know there's an onus on all of us to protect children and victim parents. And we know we have uh, a challenge to prevent uh, tragic outcomes, including, including the ongoing harm of trauma and abuse, the uh, homicide of victims, uh, and homicide of children, uh, which often occur after multiple warning signs known uh, to multiple professionals, including friends and family, and often the workplace. Our goals for today is to unpack some of these issues. Our hope is to help the participants today understand how the term alienation is misused in domestic violence and child abuse cases. We want to make sure the participants understand some of the empirical evidence of the impact of alienation claims in abuse cases. Uh, we want to encourage a more structured approach and we're gonna be talking about an example of a structured approach and a tool for screening and assessing the impact of domestic violence and child abuse in parenting and custody disputes. To get us started today, I'm pleased to turn things over to Linda Nielsen. Uh, Linda is a professor emerita at the University of New Brunswick. She's recognized as an academic authority on legal systems and domestic violence, as well as the impact of exposure to family violence on children. Uh, she's widely recognized as a scholar, has been involved in producing tremendous resources 
uh, both for judges and also lawyers practicing family law. Welcome, Linda. It's good to have you here today. Hi, um, I, my name's Linda. I'm going to speak to you today um, about the misuse of alienation concepts in Canadian family law cases. Everyone in the, in the legal system needs a basic understanding of trauma and of child, accepted child development principles. But social science theories that without proven reliability can be harmful in the legal system. And this is why courts over many years have developed um, legal admissibility rules. But what happens in practice is that resources do not always allow strenuous judicial gatekeeping. And when courts, and particularly when appeal courts endorse social science theories, which have not been scrutinized for validity and reliability, a transformation process occurs. The theories become legal principles and then courts cite other courts as authority. And when that happens, it becomes virtually impossible to challenge the, con the um, concepts on the basis of faulty research foundations. And that has already happened in the legal system in Canada. Many academics monitoring family law cases around the world have become increasingly concerned about the misuse of alienation concepts against the interests of children and abused women. This slide sets out a few of the legal academics currently co conducting research on this issue in various countries now. Their conclusions mirror the conclusions we will be presenting to you today. This is a link to my own study of alienation cases across Canada. This slide lists some of the common themes we see in the alienation literature. I'm not going to run through those, these. Um, you can refer to them from this slide. In order to investigate concerns, I searched two Canadian case law websites. Canley and Quicklaw to identify the first 300 cases ranked automatically by the websites for relevance. I then cross-checked and added new cases as they arose. Multiple cases involving the same family were counted as one case. The final sample was 357 cases. What we find found is that most parent alienation claims are made against mothers, 68.9% in this sample, and that close to a half in also included domestic violence and child abuse claims. Now, it's important to note, first of all, that Canadian courts fail to make alienation claims in about 50% of the cases. And when we look at, when you look at the reasoning in those cases, the reasoning was very similar for mothers and for fathers. It's when we look at courts applying par parent alienation concepts that we begin to see a pattern suggestive of gender bias. This chart compares um, court reactions when findings of parent alienation were made against mothers in comparison to court responses when alienation findings were made against father. What we see here in blue 
is that courts were far more apt to lead children in the primary care of fathers in these cases than in the primary care of mothers when alienation findings were made. What we also see is that courts were much more apt to impose restricted contact um, with children when the claims were made against mothers than when claims were made against fathers. And that's represented in uh, green on this slide. Some other findings. When courts applied parent alienation findings, they failed to engage in thorough statutory best interests of the child analysis in the majority of those cases. And despite the internationally recognized human rights of children, children's views were discounted in 79% of those cases. Other concerns. Canadian judges are relying on behavioral checklists from other cases to make findings of parent alienation without experts. And when so-called alienation experts testify in these cases, and I'm using the word um, alleged experts purposely, um, parent alienation is not a separate recognized field of professional expertise. When um, these experts testify, here's some of the things they told courts to do. Ignore the views and preferences of children as those views assume that they reflect the views of the assumed parent. Ignore negative parenting of the parent the children resist short of clearly established evidence of child abuse and ignore evidence of children doing well in the care of the preferred parent. And you can look at some of the uh, expert testimony in the cases listed on this slide. It's not advancing. Okay. I'll discuss the uh, problem with the use of behavioral checklists in a few moments. We also see children's closeness with mothers interpreted in a negative dismissive fashion when parental uh, alienation concepts are applied. We also see worrying use of police powers against children to force children to comply with court ordered parenting against children's will and the imposition of very expensive reunification programs on these families. We're also seeing a shift uh, in the, these cases from a focus on the best interests of children taking into account past and current circumstances to assigning um, adult blame and punishment and to family courts making orders in the hope of repairing broken parent-child relationships sometime in the future. I think we all need to think very carefully here about whether or not this is an appropriate role for our family courts. I'm turning now to the cases in which family violence and child abuse, as well as alienation claims were made. The first thing to notice on this slide in blue is how seldom the courts ordered a domestic violence expert uh, report in these cases. You can compare that uh, with how often the courts in this, these cases ordered an assessment of parent alienation, and that's represented in red uh, in 44% of the cases. The 
alleged uh, perpetrator of family violence was the parent alienation claimant in the vast majority of the cross claim cases. While Canadian courts did not make parental alienation findings against the targeted parent in 60% of the cross claim cases, even in cases where the mothers claimed both parental alienation, that the perpetrator had turned the children, and family violence against fathers, fathers were awarded unsupervised contact most 68.7% of the time. Court did make parental alienation findings in favor of alleged family violence perpetrators in a significant minority of these cases, 36.7%. And in these cases, children were removed from their primary parents and placed with the alleged, ed, allegedly abusive parent. And in many of these cases, children were denied contact with their preferred parent. Some other features of the cross-claim cases, we see a problematic dismissal of family violence evidence in, in these cases. I said earlier that I would speak to problems with checklists of behavior. If you look at the characteristic parenting patterns of domestic violators on the right-hand side of the slide, identified in family violence research over decades, and compare that list with allegedly common alienated parents' behavior on the left-hand side, you will see that the two lists are actually very similar. How can that be? Well, it could be because many alienation claimants are alleged are perpetrators of family violence, as suggested in some of the case law. Or it could be because similar behaviors can have very different causes. Canadian courts have long warned against making assumptions about causes of human behavior because we know those assumptions have commonly been wrong. These behaviors are not proof that alienation occurred any more than they are proof that domestic violence occurred. But what they do tell us is that when these behaviors occur, children require our protection. In practice, parent, in practice, Parental alienation claims are creating a classic double bind for problem for women and children. Complain about safety can become evidence of attempted alienation, increased risk. Fail to present concerns, no protection, increased risk. Children, asked to live with mothers and reduce time with allegedly abusive parent, risk that that will be interpreted as alienation. The children risk dismissal of youth and forced removal. Net effect. This probably means that the parent alienation problem is likely far worse than the case law suggests because it is very likely that family violence evidence is not being presented to courts in many cross-claim cases. 
Canadian legislation to watch. Peter mentioned positive changes to the Divorce Act in connection with family violence. I'm concerned about 163C because it creates a reverse onus. Surely every parent has an obligation to develop a positive relationship with each child, and surely that onus resides with that parent and not the other, other parent. Finally, um, the, the final slide provides links to some references and uh, additional information that you, you may want to uh, read on this topic. And now I will turn this uh, back over to Peter to introduce Simon. Uh, thank you very much, Linda, for that presentation. I'm pleased to introduce uh, Simon Lapierre. Uh, Simon is a professor at the School of Social Work at the University of Ottawa and a founding member of the Feminist Anti-Violence Research Collective. Um, focused on this topic, he's involved in two international grants uh, funded in Canada looking at uh, domestic violence and parental alienation. Welcome, Simon. We'll look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Peter. Um, so I'm going to present um, this afternoon um, some findings from uh, one of those research projects that uh, we've been conducting in both Ontario and Quebec that tries to understand uh, why is it that abused women are being labeled as uh, an alienating parents. And um, the, the research findings that I'm going to present uh, is based on different components. So the, the research is based on an analysis of policy documents, on an analysis of, um, of court decision. We've also conducted interviews with different key informants and uh, as well as case studies with uh, abused women who also provided us with different documents such as court report, child protection report and court decisions. So because it's a, it's a huge research project, I'm not going to present the entirety of the research findings, but I'm going to focus on a, a few key um, issues. I'm going to start with looking at what's going on in the province of Quebec um, uh, and then um, looking at who is actually accusing those uh, women of being uh, alienating parents. Um, and we're going to look at the power of some experts in this uh, context. And finally, I'm going to focus on the link uh, between parental alienation discourses and the invisibility of domestic violence. So what we've seen uh, in the province of Quebec is a, a growing popularity for the discourse on parental alienation over the last 10 to 15 years. And uh, we've concluded that there have been three main reasons to explain why uh, parental alienation has become so popular. And the first one is that we've noticed that over the last 15 years, a few academic researchers have conducted a lot of research on parental alienation. And um, the fact that this, um, this research was conducted in partnership with child protection agencies uh, probably helped um, to increase the, pop the popularity of, uh, of this discourse. But not only was the research conducted in partnership with child protection services, it has also led to, um, uh, to uh, training programs that have been um, implemented across the province in child protection agencies. And it has also led to the development of tool to screen for parental alienation or the risk of parental alienation. And some of those tools have been widely available on, on internet and widely used by a number of professionals involved in child protection or child custody proceedings. The second reason is we've seen in 2006 and 2007 a number of changes to the Youth Protection Act in the province of Quebec. And one of the important changes was the introduction of the category psychological ill treatment. And while this category um, 
talks about the definition of psychological ill treatment refers to, uh, amongst other things, refers to uh, the children exposure to domestic violence. Um, it really looks like uh, researchers and professionals are really keen to use psychological ill treatment as a way to legitimize the use to this discourse about parental alienation and exposure to high conflict. And that's, in fact, is really interesting because while they, they, they commonly refer to um, these, those changes in the Youth Protection Act to legitimize the recourse to parental alienation and high conflict, there is actually no reference at all uh, in the, this legislation to either high conflict or parental alienation. But they're still using it to legitimize this discourse and those practices. And the, the third reason is that we've also seen over the last 10 to 15 years an inc increased popularity in different media uh, looking at, um, at the issues around parental alienation, inviting so called victims of parental alienation, and doing panel with different professionals involved in either child protection or child custody um, proceedings to, to talk about parental alienation. And in this context where there have been a, a growing interest in parental alienation in, in the province of Quebec, we've seen that a, a large number of women who have experienced domestic violence have actually been labeled as alienating parents. And this concern was first raised by shelter workers a few years ago, about 10 years ago, but we've now have uh, growing evidence from research and uh, research on court decisions that confirm the link uh, between domestic violence and parental alienation and the fact that actually a large, while well, a significant number of abused women are uh, being labeled as, um, as alienating parents. So when we looked it in, uh, through our data where these um, accusations come from, it was quite uh, diverse. So the accusation of uh, parental alienation or concerns regarding parental alienation could be raised by either the, fa the child's father, so the woman's uh, former partners. It could be raised by the, law the father's lawyer. It could, in some cases, it was also raised uh, by child protection workers or by experts conducting a family assessment. But in some cases, it was also in those concerns were also initially raised by, by uh, the judges themselves. Um, but what's also interesting to note is that even though uh, the research findings show that it is used in some cases by uh, the child's father or the, the woman's um, former partners as a defense strategy or as a strategy to deflect attention away from their own uh, violent behaviors, uh, it looks like it really need to be taken up by some professionals to be effective. So the fathers can raise those issues, but it's only when it's, um, it's also raised by other professionals such as child protection workers or experts conducting family assessment that it become really an effective, an effective strategy that really influences um, judges' decision. But having said that, what we've also seen in our research finding is that experts conducting family assessment have been usually influential in terms of uh, labeling abuse women as, um, as uh, an alienating parents. And I really want here to, to provide an example where in one case that we've analyzed, uh, one case study that we've analyzed, we've seen that in this specific case, and as it is also the case in other cases that we've analyzed, um, concerns regarding the, ch the child's safety and well-being, and regarding the father's uh, violent, dangerous, and problematic behaviors had been raised by the child himself, by the, the child's mother. Concerns as have, had also been raised by ch several child protection workers who were asking for uh, father-child con contact to be limited or stop. Uh, concerns had also be raised by shelter workers who had done um, safety plans with both the child and the mother. And in this case, we also had a therapist who had been working with the mother for some time who raised concerns uh, about the mother's, uh, ex the mother's experience of domestic violence and post-traumatic syndrome. And there were also plenty of evidence from the police and the criminal justice system. But despite all this 
evidence and the fact that all those workers involved with the family for some time have raised uh, significant concerns and have asked for limited uh, to limit or stop father child contact. It is really one, once the um, judge asked for one psychologist uh, to conduct an expertise to assess, uh, to do a family assessment, that this expert who totally dismissed the domestic violence um, concluded that um, the child resistance was in fact uh, explained by the mother's uh, alienating behavior. And that what's really influenced the, the, the judge in this decision. And the judge actually did not uh, accept to limit or stop father-child contact, but in fact, remove custody from the mother and give custody to the father's aunt in order to increase contact with the father to go to either a shared custody, a full custody to the father. Uh, so that really raised concerns regarding the, the um, the, the power of, of experts in those proceedings, but also the power of this parental alienation discourse, despite a lot of evidence uh, regarding the father's violent and dangerous behavior. Mm -hmm. And in this specific case, the, not only the, the, the judge um, um, decided that to dismiss uh, the history of domestic violence and to uh, to uh, conclude that the mother was an alienating parent and that her behavior was detrimental to the child. The judge also um, was really harsh. And here you have some quotes from the court decision that I'm not going to read because we don't have enough time. But the judge, you can see that the judge was really harsh uh, with the child protection worker in the case because the child protection workers still ask for contact to be limited or stop despite the expert's uh, evaluation. And that, uh, in that context, the judge considered that the child protection workers uh, intervention was a failure and did not understand why it was still, uh, the child protection worker was still maintaining that uh, father-child contact could, should be limited. And in the same court decision, the judge was also really harsh with the, child with the shelter workers saying that they lack judgment, uh, neutrality, objectivity, uh, and nuance because they maintain the idea that uh, the child resistant was explained by the father's violent behavior rather than by the mother parent uh, alienating behaviors. And in fact, in that case, the judge accused the child protection workers and the shelter workers to be part of this parental alienation dynamic. I now, now I want to turn my attention to the link uh, between parental alienation discourses and the invisibility of, of domestic violence. And that really, what we've seen in our research finding is that really goes in both direction in terms of, uh, in fact, the fact that DV, uh, domestic violence, is dismissed, is not identified, uh, and that those situations as labeled as high conflict, that's really what um, allow parental alienation allegation to, uh, to emerge. But also once parental alienation um, allegation have emerged, well, once concerns have been raised, uh, all other concerns regarding uh, domestic violence or any signs of domestic violence then become dismissed because the, those concerns are seen as other signs or other proof of uh, the child being alienated or the, the mother being an alienating parent. So, um, uh, so, so uh, in fact, domestic violence become and remain invisible in this context. Uh, and in fact, what we've also seen is that several women and children actually at some point just stop to raise concern and to talk about domestic violence because they, they can see that it actually um, it's detrimental uh, to their case. Mm -hmm. uh, with relation to the invisibility of, of domestic violence, what we've also seen is that there is a close uh, relationship between parental alienation and the idea of false allegation of domestic violence. And what was quite interesting in the research finding is that 
while on the one hand in Quebec, it looks like most people are, are really careful about concluding that children make false allegations of child sexual abuse. Uh, the, the people we've met in the documents that we've analyzed um, actually claim that domestic false allegations of domestic violence are a really frequent problem. And what we've seen is that uh, there are three main patterns. One is that a uh, woman can be uh, accused of making false allegations because they're a malicious mother and they want to they want revenge and they want to make gains gains for themselves at the expense of their ex-partner uh, but also uh, uh, women have also been accused of making false allegation due to mental health problem so they've been seen as uh, making up uh, situation of domestic violence, but exaggerating the nature of the or the effect of domestic violence due to, to some issues with mental health problem. And that's really the idea that they actually transmit their anxiety to their children, sometimes even unconsciously. And final, and, and it should be noted that even though the focus is on the mother's behavior in those cases, in most cases, the professionals involved in those cases have not seen any of those behaviors, but those have been, uh, um, they've made inference based on the children's uh, resistance. And finally, the children have also been seen as making false allegation, but for uh, com in contrast with the mothers, those children have not been seen as malicious children, but as victim and being negatively influenced by their, uh, their mother's uh, behavior. And I really want to conclude with, with uh, some concerns regarding how children's views have been treated in, in child protection or child custody proceedings. Um, and I think those are really odd, but also really um, interesting that children's voices have been seen as being really suspicious. Um, and it is really odd because some of those situation would actually be um, situation where you would have seen the, the would have been really positive in terms of assessing the credibility of a witness. But in those cases where they've been seen as parental initiation situation, uh, those children's voices have been seen as really suspicious. It is a case when actually it looks like when, when, when children have, uh, are able to really clearly articulate their, uh, their views regarding father-child relationship, that uh, has been seen as something really suspicious. It is also the case when children um, views are really consistent throughout the process that's seen as also being really suspicious. And third, uh, when children views um, are consistent with the views of their, their brothers, sisters, or mothers. And finally, uh, and I find that one really worrying, um, and I'll conclude on that, is it looks like when children want to be heard and listened to in itself that's seen as suspicious. And that's a quote, quote from one of the court decision where the only fact that those children wanted to be listened to by the judge was seen as a sign of those children being alienated by their mothers, which obviously raised concern regarding both women's rights and children's rights in those circumstances. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, I'll now call on uh, uh, Joan Meyer. Joan is a professor of clinical law and director of the National Family Violence Law Center at George Washington University Law School. Um, particularly relevant for today's presentation, uh, she just completed a major study entitled Child Custody Outcomes in Cases Involving Parental Alienation and Abuse Allegations that was funded by the U.S. National Institute of Justice and received wide circulation and publicity uh, from many media outlets, including the Washington Post and the New Yorker. Welcome, Joan. Good to have you here. Thank you so much, Peter and everyone trying to advance my slide. Okay, hold on. It's just a little delayed. Sorry. Um, delighted to be here um, and join this really amazing webinar. So I'm going to give you guys a very brief set of highlights and just start by talking about why we did the study. I call it the Family Court Outcome Study, the FCO study. Um, I, had, I had launched and was running a nonprofit called DV Leap for the Domestic Violence Legal Empowerment and Appeals Project. And I had been working there for a good 10 years. Um, and 
Uh, we worked there primarily on appeals. And so we received many, many, many hundreds and probably thousands of referrals and desperate parents seeking help with their custody and abuse cases. Um, sometimes wanting an appeal, sometimes not able to get an appeal. So we were consulting, we were reviewing many, many cases. We took a select number of appeals. And what we found was a common pattern in which parental alienation labeling was almost predictably when you heard from a mother seeking help, you knew that alienation had been raised, she was alleging abuse and she was being called an alienator. Um, and what we saw also anecdotally and impressionistically was that when child abuse allegations as opposed to domestic violence allegations were raised, that courts and evaluators um, and family court professionals generally were particularly skeptical and or hostile. Just gonna start by giving you a couple examples of, of many, many more. Um, one was from Arkansas in which the custody evaluator reported that he asked the child, good question, what is your biggest worry? child's answer was, my biggest worry is my father killing me and saying my mother did it, which I thought was an incredible capture of the dynamic of abusers. <laughs> I'll kill the kid and I'll put it, pin it on the mom, what could be better? Um, and the evaluator concluded from that answer that the boy's negativity toward his father was unnatural and abnormal, and that it was therefore a manifestation of the parental alienation syndrome. You have the link to some of the briefs slide. Um, this was an uh, evaluator who was sort of like the go-to evaluator in Arkansas and uh, was also the referral evaluator for the Child Welfare Agency. Oops. Second example is from California more recently. Um, in this case, um, the, the mother had could tell that the abuse of the father, her abuse was escalating and she had hidden a tape recorder and she managed to get it turned on before he started to really brutally rape her. Um, and as a result of that, she managed to get a felony conviction for the felony sexual assault. Um, the, ch the father's in prison, but he's still litigating for, uh, in addition to the divorce and the financial arrangements, he's still litigating to ensure his parental rights. And um, the in this case, the evaluator was was objective and open-minded and the child said, among other things, I don't wanna be around my daddy when he's mad. And there were a lot of details I'm not giving you here that indicate the way the father had been treating the child was quite abusive. And the evaluator confirmed it and said, frankly, this child is afraid of him. Um, nonetheless, the judge spoke to an alienation expert at a luncheon that he went to, gave her his version of the hypothetical of the case and got her to say, uh, one thing you don't do in alienation cases is you don't put them in therapy. Regular therapy never works. So he comes back to court and announces that the mother has created a revisionist history, quote unquote, about the father's treatment of the children, that the boy's fear is nothing more than collateral damage from the wife abuse, by the way, implicitly indicating that it doesn't matter at all if it's just collateral damage from the wife abuse. Um, and that, the product, and that their fear was the product of her conscious or unconscious statements to the children. Again, uh, this, this relates to how Simon ended, the idea that even if mothers don't intend to alienate the children from their father, their unconscious fear or anger or whatever rubs off on them and alienates them and it's all the mother's fault. Um, in this case, we were able to win the appeal, which, is, which wasn't a common outcome, but we did succeed in this case. Okay, so as a result of cases like this um, and numerous trainings that I and others were doing, trainings of judges, lawyers, evaluators, all kinds of experts on these issues and we were not seeing much change, we, I decided we really needed data to, um, to demonstrate whether what we were seeing anecdotally at that point was actually a system, systematic pattern across the country or not and hoping that neutral objective data might persuade folks that there was a serious problem if it, if it confirmed our experiences. This is the team that I put together, luckily a kind of powerhouse team and the NIJ granted the award, I think on the strength of that in part. Um, the study uh, launched in 2014 and here's what we looked at. We wanted a national picture. So we uh, had to use electronically published opinions and it was over this 10 year period. We limited it to private custody cases involving abuse or alienation claims. So it's not all custody cases, but it's cases with these claims. And we 
came up with far more cases than we intended. To, and we were able to triage it down to over 4,000. We coded way too many things. We have not finished analyzing many of the things that we coded. Um, the data I'm going to present though today is really based on more like closer to 2,000 cases because a lot of those 4,000 that stayed in the data set were not pertinent to these analyses. So very brief highlights of these three categories of things. First, um, what we saw in terms of the rates at which courts credit or believe abuse claims by mothers about children or themselves and the rates of custody losses for such mothers. Then some very brief um, comments on some gender analyses we did and some very brief comments on what we found um, empirically about the impact of guardians ad litem and evaluators, supposedly neutral professionals in the cases. Okay, so first, um, the way I break down all of this data is I start with what happens when it's a pure abuse case in the sense that there's no alienation claim as far as we could tell from the opinions that we were coding. Um, and even in these cases without alienation cross claims, we found that courts only believed or accepted mothers partner violence allegations less than half the time. And as you can see, child and physical and sexual abuse, they accepted far, far less, very, very rarely, less than a third for physical, less than a fifth for sexual abuse. So very skeptical courts to begin with. And on a, that averaged out to 41%, uh, if you averaged all of the types of abuse allegations and the rates at which courts believed them. And then when, the, when we looked at the cases where there were alienation cross claims, we saw that it dramatically reduces courts acceptance of abuse claims even further. So where DV was believed 45% of the time before, now it's only 37. Where child abuse was believed 29% of the time before, now it's dropped to 18. And where sexual abuse was believed 15% of the time, it drops to 2% or one measly case out of 51, in which a court was willing to believe the abuse allegation when the accused abuser cross-claimed alienation. Overall, that averages out to courts accepting abuse claims almost half as, half as often, 23%, less than a quarter of the time. This is really just a visual of the same thing I just said. The bar charts show you that uh, the difference when, um, uh, when there's abuse claims and when there's not. So the, the dark blue is when there's not, uh, sorry, alienation claims. The dark blue is when there's not alienation claims. The gray is when there are. And as you can see, the blue bars are longer than the gray, but even the blue bars are, you know, they don't exceed 45% in terms of just belief, court's belief. Overall, we translate all of this into saying that the impact of an alienation cross-claim reduces the likelihood of any abuse claim being believed by a factor of two, but it reduces the likelihood of child abuse being believed by a factor of nearly four. And that is driven primarily by the deep resistance to child sexual abuse claims. Moving to custody losses, and this is how we defined it very, very stringently because we didn't wanna get into arguments um, about uh, our stretching things to get higher data. So very stringent data reduced the number of cases we could look at, but we had enough for statistical significance. So we say, uh, we call it a custody loss if the mother started with primary physical care, whether or not it was an award of custody. Um, and then at the end, the father is awarded primary. So from primary to primary, that's how we are defining custody losses. Um, and even without alienation cross claims, we find that mothers who allege domestic violence or partner violence lose custody altogether roughly a quarter of the time. Mothers who allege child physical abuse lose custody more than that, 29%, and sexual abuse, 28%, all of it averaging out at mothers losing custody about a quarter of the time, again, if they allege abuse at all, even without a cross-claim of alienation. With a cross-claim of alienation, that escalates drastically. So whereas domestic violence alleging mothers lost custody under a quarter of the time without alienation. With alienation, that goes up to over a third of the time. Child physical abuse skyrockets up to almost 60% of the time and child sexual abuse, 56% of the time. So whereas it was, uh, they were losing custody on average 26% of the time without an alienation claim, when that comes in, they're losing it 50% of the time. One out of two cases, if he cross claims alienation. 
And of course, you don't know before you go to court whether you're going to get that cross claim. So uh, you have to uh, prepare for that, to strategize for that. And we do have other data, which I'm not sharing today, that mixes these all together and shows you what the odds are if you don't know. Um, and obviously, it comes out in between those cases without alienation and those cases with. Again, translating the impact of the alienation cross claim on mother's losses of custody, what we find is that they have almost three times the odds of taking custody from mothers alleging any kind of abuse when they allege alienation as compared to when they do not. And we did find a number of cases where courts believed that the, that the had been either battering the using the child and 13% of those, uh, the mother still lost custody to the abuser. Some of those, I can't tell you off the top how many, um, but some of those were cases where the courts believed that the mothers were alienators, but not all, definitely not all. And for good, the good news here is that they never awarded child sexual abusers custody. Yay for that. <laughs> so two gender findings very briefly. Um, first of all, overall, we were able to show that alienation claims are far more powerful for fathers than they are for mothers. And we did have a, a significant minority of cases where mothers accused fathers of alienation. We even had a subset of cases where fathers accused mothers of abuse and mothers accused fathers of alienation, a perfect gender reversal. Um, uh, but we did not have statistically significant results, although we did find a bias in those, at the appearance of a bias. But in all cases of alienation, and this includes some without abuse claims, what we found was that when fathers accused mothers of alienation, they were able to take custody away 44% of the time. And that is driven mostly from when they proved alienation, when the court decided it was true. When mothers accused fathers of alienation, they were only able to take custody 28% of the time. This is a statistically significant difference, and it means that mothers have twice the odds of losing custody compared to fathers when they are accused of alienation. So a pretty good confirmation of what we, I think most of us impressionistically thought we knew, which is that it's a very gendered concept and is used in gender ways. We did find some very interesting um, gender parities. First, we found that when courts do believe that a parent is an alienator, whether it's a mother or a father, that they lost custody at surprisingly identical rates, 71%. And we also found that in the cases without abuse claims, and again, let me stress that we were relying on the court opinions that were published online, doesn't mean there were no abuse claims, but there were none mentioned in the opinion. We found that um, while there was a differential um, in terms of how often uh, mothers and fathers lost custody in the non-abuse cases, we were not able to prove statistical significance of this differential. Um, and that's primarily because there's, there's a fairly small number of fathers beginning with the primary care of the children in our data set, just based on reality. And so it was, it, the numbers were small. One last um, finding is, uh, relates to GALs and evaluators. Um, and what we found, we, were, we wanted to test what our impressionistic view was, which was that the role of these neutral professionals was not favorable to mothers alleging abuse. And the data were very powerful in underlining that. We found that the mother's odds of losing custody were 3.5 times greater when a GAL was in the case than when they were not. Pretty shocking particularly given that GALs are supposed to, to be advocating for children's best interests. We found that when there was an evaluator in the case, depending on the type of abuse, I'm giving you a range here, mother's odds of losing custody ranged from 2.5 to 6.5. That 6.5, six, that, 6 that really high rate of losing custody uh, reflects cases where mothers alleged both child physical and sexual abuse, which for some reason seemed to be particularly toxic. Um, we found we were able to do a comparison of these professionals' effects on fathers' losses of custody when alleging um, abuse or, or not. And we found that they have no statistically significant effect on fathers' losses of custody. And as a result, because they increase mothers' rates of losses, but not fathers, they significantly increase the gender differential in outcomes. I do need to mention 
the limitations of the study. Um, and the first and most important one is that the study itself does not go behind the court's opinion. So it does not question the court's findings or prove that the findings are wrong. So when the court chooses to disbelieve abuse, we just report it. We don't say if it's wrong or not. Um, the, the fact that we, had, we were limited to electronic cases meant that um, most of our data set involved cases that had gone up on appeal because mostly uh, tr most trial courts don't usually publish their opinions online or otherwise. Although we did get a significant group of trial court opinions that were published online and we were able to do some comparisons from that. Um, so the point being that, uh, the third point being that um, we're relying on the opinions uh, to categorize cases as whether they're abuse or not or alienation or not. And it is very possible that some of those cases, there were allegations of abuse or alienation that were not mentioned in the opinion, which we could not know. And the last footnote there shows that when we compared trial court opinions that didn't go up on appeal to the cases that had gone up on appeal, we found a, a lower rate of custody losses, which is not surprising because those are the cases that are most likely to be appealed. But we did find consistent gender differences in outcomes uh, between trial and, and cases that went up on appeal. A little bit of info you have in the slides for how to contact me or follow up or get a copy of the study. And over to Loretta. Thank you very much, Joan. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Loretta Frederick. Um, Loretta is the Senior Legal and Policy Advisor for the Battered Women's Justice Project, a national resource center on the legal system's response to domestic violence. She's a co-developer of the SAFER Project, uh, for child custody cases involving abuse, which she'll be talking about today. And uh, for the last uh, two decades, she's been involved with the U.S. Department of Justice program called the National Judicial Institutes on Domestic Violence, which involves enhancing judicial skills uh, for judges involved in uh, domestic violence cases. Loretta, over to you. If you can put on your video and your Sound. Shall do. Thank you much. Hello, everybody. Um, so I am here to introduce you to an approach to child custody cases for family court practitioners. And that would be basically anybody who is uh, working with a family member where uh, intimate partner violence um, is an issue and there is some kind of agreement or <clears throat> lack thereof around what to do with children in the wake of, um, of a separation of the parties. So um, the first thing I'd like to do is to just tell you where we're headed with this 15 minutes. We're hoping that by the end of this little segment, mm -hmm. you'll be better able to assess the utility of this safer approach to identifying, assessing, and responding to domestic violence or intimate partner violence in child custody cases. Mm -hmm. And secondly, that, um, that you would consider using our uh, worksheets and guides to improve your ability to screen for and then assess any intimate partner violence in the case and the relationship between the IPV and a child's resistance to contact with a parent, recognizing um, the overlap and co-occurrence of these issues as you've heard about in um, the other faculty today. So um, I'd like to start by just telling you what this um, approach is all about. It was introduced over the last 10 years. Um, my organization has been working um, with support from several US um, federal departments uh, we, they, they gave us the um, task of trying to figure out how family court systems could do a better job handling these child custody cases where intimate partner violence was an issue. Um, and we had an advisory board that had experts on it from Praxis International, which is a, a um, NGO here in the United States and uh, the role of the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, and also the Association of Family and Conciliation Courts. We, um, <clears throat> we are assuming for purposes of this 15 minutes and all of the work that we do on this project, 
that um, uh, intimate partner violence can take many forms and can have a lot of different features and it can serve a bunch of different purposes and it can have a lot of different kinds of effects from family to family and even child to child within the same family. <clears throat> and because intimate partner violence can vary so drastically from family to family and over time, um, it can have uh, extreme significance or less significance uh, to families um, around their parenting arrangements. And the intimate partner violence can also play a big role in children's decision-making um, about uh, their parents and also can affect how they uh, react to and might resist uh, contact with a parent. So um, we, because this approach gives you the tools to assess the intimate partner violence and any effects that it might have on parenting and so forth, we're gonna introduce you to it today um, in the hopes that you might be able to use it to get underneath what's really going on um, in an individual family. So this um, is the uh, approach. Screening, SAFER is a, an acronym, and the S stands for Screen for Intimate Partner Violence. And that basically is just asking the question, is abuse an issue here? It's kind of like going through screening at the airport. Uh, they're trying to prevent people from getting on airplanes with guns and stuff, uh, but, the, um, but the devices can also pick up coins in your pocket. Um, the coin in the pocket, however, doesn't tell you what to do. It only tells you you have to look further into what is triggering the alarm. Um, and so as with uh, IPV, once you know intimate partner violence is an issue, all you're doing is figuring out whether it's a problem, in which case you assess the nature and the context of the abuse to figure out what is really going on there. Um, even though, however, you know the full range um, of the kind of violence it is, the kind of tactics that are going on, you don't really know what's going on with an individual child or with parents unless you look at what the effects of the abuse might be. And you're asking the question then, why does the abuse matter? And when you've done that, you're in a much better position to actually do something about the abuse and that is responding. So this um, approach is accompanied by a bunch of material that can help you implement this and it's all color coded, which is why there are four different colors on your screen and we'll be referencing those um, as we go forward here to your little introduction. Um, I just wanna say first off, um, you cannot possibly learn how to uh, use this approach successfully in a 15 minute introduction. So I would really urge everybody to come to the BWJP website uh, at some point in the near future and check out all the resources, including practice guides and worksheets. Um, you've got some of that material in your handouts for today, but there's a lot more of it available on the website. So screening, the first little piece of, of this um, approach is um, what we're gonna look at here. So what is screening? Basically screening is simply a routine process for identifying a potential problem. That's all it is, just like the metal detector at the airport. It's, it's um, a tentative, like I need to look further kind of step. And um, it's a way to find out um, if, you, um, if you need to look further, but it is not a judgment. You're not making a call. You're not making a final decision on anything. And it's not the same thing as an assessment. We have a bunch of uh, resources that you can use to do this. <clears throat> One example is a blue uh, rimmed worksheet. Now you got a set of worksheets in your materials. As I indicated, I can't teach you how to use them all right here in this short introduction. But just know that one of those worksheets is one where you can keep track of what you have uncovered when you're screening for intimate partner violence, the range of behaviors you might be um, seeing um, and or being alleged, and uh, you can keep track of it on that worksheet. The other um, options we have available to you are a uh, initial domestic violence screening guide, 
which is um, a, a document you also received in your materials. Uh, this has um, a number of questions in the blue on the left side. And then on the right side of that um, uh, screening guide, there are things um, that you can um, kind of be looking for and keep track of as you're doing screening. There is another option and that is um, a longer document that is a um, seven page um, um, interview guide that has the same screening questions as in the first guide, but it's more detailed. So if you wanna follow up further, there are many more examples of kinds of questions you can be asking and stuff to pursue. Um, so um, I should also tell you that in those worksheets that you got, there are some basic worksheets, four of them, one for each of these four steps, screen, assess, focus on the effects and respond. Um, and there are detailed worksheets that expand upon the basic categories in each of those worksheets. So um, we will just be introducing you to a couple of them today, just to give you a taste of how this might work. <clears throat> this is an example. Um, a close-up. You, you probably still can't read this, so you should be looking at the materials you got today. Um, this is the screening guide, um, and you'll see there are eight different areas to pursue and, um, and some follow-up behaviorally specific things in that um, lower right-hand quadrant. So if you want behaviorally specific information from somebody about the abuse, you can ask follow-up questions using that. We do extensive training on how to screen for intimate partner violence and how to reduce the barriers to um, <clears throat> disclosure of IPV. Um, so um, this is a, just a general introduction. So um, we have a short video clip. Let's see, where is it? A video clip. There it is. Good. Um, let me just it? warn you. This is a, thank you. This, um, this depicts an act of intimate partner violence. So if that is a problem for you, please be forewarned and turn off the volume. Uh, this is a simply an audio less visual. So thank you much. Where's, where's dinner? Well, I thought you'd be home a couple of hours ago, and what, I what, put what, everything away, what, so what I What is this? Pizza? What, uh, uh, pizza? If you had just called me, I would have dinner, known what Dinner it... ready is a pizza. I didn't know you'd be so late. Let me ask you, you something. Is, me, is it I, uh, too much to have dinner waiting so when I go home? Loud. Please don't be so loud. Don't tell me what to do! You shut up! I thought you'd be home I can get earlier. pizza! I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll do I something better. I'll, I'll do something, something now. better. Let go of me. Get in the kitchen. No. Well, <laughs> oh, it hurts. Do you want to see what hurts? That's what hurts. That's what hurts. <laughs> now get up and clean up this mess. Shut up. I'll be quiet. I'll be quiet. <laughs> For information, call 1 800 and. Where's, where's dinner? Well, I thought you'd be home. Okay. Thank you so much for the help of that, Sarah. Um, anyway, I'm sorry to um, play such an alarming short clip for you, but uh, we're doing it so that we can highlight how it is that. Um, some of these resist refuse cases can be related to domestic violence and how the safer approach can help you unpack the connection, if any, between abuse and a child's um, actions or preference. So um, what I'd like to do first is uh, tell you that, as I indicated, we think that there is a range of context for domestic violence. And they include what does the abuser intend by their violence? So that is to say, what are they trying to accomplish? What do they think they're doing? Um, and in the case that you just saw, Tom, the, the name of the guy that's down in the kitchen um, assaulting um, the mother of this little boy, 
um, his purpose is probably to get what he wants when he wants it, to assert his power um, and to ensure that whatever he sets in the way of rules get complied with. Um, the second piece of context is what does the, the violence mean to the victim of it? Um, and perhaps even to the child. And in this case, Mary down in the kitchen, um, among other things, um, I'm sure understands that she needs to try to predict every one of the demands that her partner might have of her to put his interests over her own and put her interests over the child to avoid being harmed further. Um, and then and the effect of the abuse is another piece of this context. Uh, and that is basically um, who gets to make the rules as a result of the violence? Uh, what are the victim's options? What are the long-term and short-term effects? Um, and in Mary's case, um, she, um, she uh, knows that um, <clears throat> he is making the rules, uh, that he will go to great lengths, including harming her, significantly harming her. Um, and she can't predict where he'll draw the line. Uh, and therefore she has the heightened responsibility to care for the child. Uh, it might even have a diminished capacity to, um, to do that under the um, circumstances. So um, what we've um, learned over time is there are really three contexts for which intimate partner violence can occur. One is coercive controlling abuse, which is the most significant and problematic in the custody context. Uh, but also many abused um, um, uh, people who are subject to course of controlling abuse use violence back at their abusers. And this is sometimes called violent resistance. It's very different from course of controlling abuse. Uh, and then there are some couples where there is no uh, power and control, course of control going on. But um, what's important to know is that it's common that we don't see the course of control um, and we miss it and therefore guess wrong about what we should be doing around parenting arrangements. So just a brief introduction to course of control. It is, this is Evan Stark who wrote a book on the topic, his um, um, definition. <clears throat> it's a knowing and harmful course of conduct that makes a person subordinate or dependent um, and it, there are several tech tactics that are used to, to accomplish this end, isolating them from their support sources, exploiting the victim's resources, regulating, sometimes micro-regulating their daily lives, and, and then keeping them from escaping. And uh, what is significant about course of control is that it is different, not just an extreme form, it is categorically different than um, other kinds of violence and it entraps the survivor. Mm -hmm. So the problem is you can't test for it and it may be hard to see. Mm -hmm. It can look just like low level abuse. Here are some resources that we have available to assess mm -hmm. the nature and the context of the abuse. And um, there are worksheets including mm -hmm. the um, green basic worksheet on assessing the nature and the context of the abuse, mm -hmm. and then detailed worksheets mm -hmm. that go into great detail on each one of those four columns in the effects, uh, the assessing mm -hmm. the nature and context. This is a landing pad that we sometimes use to keep track of what we're uncovering and, and finding in the detailed um, analysis and then filling out the detailed worksheets and then summarizing what we learned and, and um, putting it on this landing pad. So here's an example. Um, in the upper left hand corner, there is, let's see, if you see the left hand column, it says upper left hand corner abuse of the victim parent and interference with the victim, which is course of control. Underneath that, how does the child experience the abuse? And then on the next column, how does the abuser parent? And then underneath that, the co-parenting relationship. So these are all pieces of the um, analysis of the abuse. 
And here's an example of a detailed worksheet. It gives examples of each one of these types. So uh, here's another example of a detailed worksheet on coercive control. And we have another worksheet that talks all about the ways in which children can be experiencing the abuse directly, um, the initial effects, the long-term effects, the aftermath, and it gives examples of each one of them so that when you're uncovering that kind of material, you know exactly what you're looking for. Then you can fill out the little worksheets with check marks where things are an issue and noting with intensity scales how big of a deal it might be. So these are basically the things you would use to assess the nature and the context. There are also a lot of materials about how to um, examine the effects of the abuse on the child, on the victim parent, and, um, and also through the lens of the best interests of the child. Here's an example of a filled out worksheet. Loretta, can you wrap up? Yep, that is the end of the presentation. We have one resource on um, responding with a lot of different examples for what you can look at when uh, trying to respond to the IPV. Thank you, Peter. Thank you all for your presentations. Um, I thought we, we just had a, uh, didn't mean to rush you there, Loretta, but wanted to leave time for some burning burning questions. And uh, I think I, I picked on common questions we've gotten from previous webinars or pre-COVID when we did live presentations. And maybe I'll start with you, Linda. So I guess one concern uh, that we hear commonly is about potentially victims or women lying about family violence in order to get an upper hand in custody and access cases. Um, any, any comments on, on that question? Yes, um, when, when we look at the um, well-designed studies, and by that I mean uh, studies that look, um, uh, take into account filtering processes and negotiation processes that result in information about family violence reaching or not reaching the courts. When we look at well-designed studies, we find that the rates of uh, misinformation or misleading or lying about family violence are very low. Uh, um, it's very uh, rare if we're looking at say 5% as opposed to 90 to 95%. Empirically, the far more serious problem is information about family violence not reaching courts when decisions are made. And um, empirically, that's a far, far uh, more serious problem. Uh, Simon, I, was, I, I might have rushed you a bit on your last slide about uh, children's voices. And uh, I, I just I think if, if I'm listening to this as a judge or a lawyer, uh, are you implying that we should always believe what children say verbatim? Um, any thoughts about that? Well, you, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that children never lie, but I think when we look specifically at allegation of violence or abuse, actually research evidence shows us that there are really rare occurrence. And actually when we look at those really rare cases, fathers are more likely to lie about and make false allegations than mothers and children. But, but I would also add that actually children have the right to be listened to and to be protected. So I would argue that actually just dismissing what they say and dismissing their, their worries and their concerns about their dad's behavior is a serious infringement to children's rights. So I think we can't, I'm not saying that we should always believe what they say uh, and, and that they're never, they never lie, but I, I don't think we have the right to just dismiss what they're saying like we do when we uh, use the concept of parental alienation. And Joan, in, in looking at your study and your, in your presentation, um, I guess, I'm sure you agree that each case is unique. Uh, I'm sure every judge and lawyer uh, tells me each case, case is unique. And when, when, you, when you, I guess the question that I come to mind is that in some of the cases, 
How do you know the courts are wrong in disbelieving women alleging abuse? Well, we don't. Um, certainly the study does not prove one way or the other, whether the courts are right or wrong. The purpose of the study is just to map what courts are doing, what they're saying, and to show that there's some very clear trends of not believing, and especially not believing child abuse, and the role of GALs and evaluators. So we can take nothing from the study itself about whether the courts are right or wrong. However, the study was done in the context and, and in response to a flood, a continuing flood of complaints and reports of horrific outcomes in court. And some of them are ending in the murder of the child by the parent the mother was seeking protection from. So um, there is enough anecdotal reporting and it is, it is growing and growing and it's also global. And when you see the global patterns that are identical, it makes it harder to say, well, we don't know what this means. It, it, it's, it fits a pattern that is global. Okay, thank you. And Loretta, obviously your, your safer uh, tool and framework has reached Canada and gone around the world. And I'm just wondering in the US, how widely used is this? How, when you've done presentations, do you know how many people you've presented to or how many different states? Um, well, we have, uh, we've trained over 20,000 people in the United States and also in Australia. Um, and um, people from likely every state, um, because we do a lot of international conferences. Um, and there are uh, maybe five different jurisdictions that have done more in that intense um, implementation on a community wide basis where uh, people are uh, trying to get all the practitioners, um, the lawyers, the judges, the evaluators, and so forth, um, exploring the uh, intimate partner violence in this full um, fashion. Now, Loretta, you, you crammed a lot into 15 minutes, and I, I obviously that's not training people to use the no. safer. No. Um, how long, I guess, if, if I'm a practitioner, you can get <laughs> overwhelmed looking at the slides. And I guess the question that comes to mind practically, you know, do I have to screen every new case? And, and if I do, how long does this take? Right, good question. Um, uh, every single new case needs to be screened for intimate partner violence because many cases do not come in flagged as such. You can't tell by looking at a case unless you really uh, do a screen. And you have to do it in every case, no matter the gender of the parent and you also need to know that if IPV is not an issue and it's not raised in your screening, a screening can take 10 minutes. It's like not a big deal. When, however, there is something going on, it takes longer and you've got to know when that stuff is going on. So you do have to invest the time necessary to explore it. Um, Simon, just coming back to uh, something you, you talked about in from your research on how, how quickly it appears abused women may get labeled as alienating parents. But what are your, from your review, particularly in Quebec, but other Ontario as well, what practices need to change that, that will reduce that kind of labeling? Uh, I think we do need to raise concern and make concerns heard about the, the misuse of parental alienation. But I think what we really need is more training on domestic violence and exactly like you know what Lurga is proposing. We need more screening and more assessment in domestic violence. And you know, I've been training um, uh, child protection workers over the last year on domestic violence. And one of the things that they keep saying at the end of the training is, well, actually, now that I understand domestic violence, I realize that maybe 50% 50, 50 of the cases that I've seen as high conflict, I'll now realize that there are domestic violence. And that's a big issue and it's really problematic. So I think if there's one thing that need to be done is more training, in-depth training on domestic violence for more screening and more assessment. Uh, Simon, I thought your one thing was interesting in your presentation is just how things vary from one jurisdiction to, to the next and, and how this can take a hold in, in some states or, or provident, provinces. So I think that's an interesting perspective. I think at this point, we're, we're out of time. We promised the uh, participants that would be, we'd go from one to 2.30. Eastern Standard Time, and maybe I can call on Linda Baker for uh, her closing comments. Linda, what one thing, um, I know you're going to say this, but just in case you don't, um, I got a couple of emails during the presentation um, 
people hungry for resources, especially Loretta, the way she teased people with some of those slides. And they, they want to get the whole thing. So uh, might, might make a comment on that if you could. Yes, um, I definitely will. Um, I want to first of all thank all of the panelists. Um, we just we were engrossed throughout the entire presentation. And I think the importance of um, the issue, it, we know that, and the fact that so many people, we had well over 2,000 people register and 14,000 people participated in the webinar. So it speaks to the importance of the research that you're all doing and the resources that you're developing. And we truly thank you, um, Loretta, Joan, Simon, Peter, Linda, um, we're, we're truly uh, appreciative. We also wanted to remind everybody that the resources that people have shared with us, whether those are research papers or the tools that Loretta discussed, that we will have links to them, or in some cases, if they were handouts, we'll actually have those on a web page that will have the recording of this webinar as well as the bios of our presenters and other information. So resources and the recording of this webinar, um, please go to the Learning Network web and, uh, website and you'll find those there. We also wanted to remind you that the evaluation is going to be sent out right away. And the team, the Knowledge Hub team and the Learning Network team, we are busy preparing our next season of webinars. And so it's really important that you give us your feedback. Let us know what worked, what do you want more of? And that'll help us in our planning for the next series. And so with that, want to um, give a special thanks to Becky and Christopher for the ASL interpretation throughout the webinar. And we want you all to be safe and hope to see you soon.